Hello, everybody. This is, uh, of course, our KP Candid Conversations, and I am super excited about this because uh, a brand new partnership that we have uh, with uh, our uh, partners down in San Diego, San Diego Wave FC, uh, the football club in San Diego, women's football club in San Diego. Um, and I've got joining me right now, Bailey Torres, the head of medical, head athletic trainer for the team. Um, I'm super excited about this just because I am, I'm new to, to soccer, football, right? Whatever, however you want to call it. Okay. Um, so I'm learning the rules. I'm, I've always been a big baseball fan, but uh, I've just been learning the sport. And it's so exciting, especially uh, women's soccer. So uh, first of all, tell me about how this all came to be. I mean, it's super exciting that we're in San Diego doing this. Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Uh, the We play in a, in a league called the National Women's Soccer League, so the NWSL, and uh, the NWSL is celebrating 10 years this year, and so uh, what a what a better year to join. Uh, so we are new this year in uh, San Diego and new to the league and just rearing and ready to go, top of the table, 12 12 weeks in, how, how far are we in? I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know today is Monday, I think, but that's, uh, yeah, we're doing well. How I, It's got to feel so special to be a, a part of this and a part of this movement. Absolutely. Going through an inaugural season is in, is incredible because you just have everybody around you that's so excited to be here and so excited to, um, you know, continue the progress that this league has made over the last 10 years and continue to build it and grow it and get the fan base, get the support and, and find ways to do so. And so, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Everybody here is all on the same page and, and just moving in that, that direction. We've watched so many uh, U S soccer teams, for the World Cup women's soccer teams that have been so fantastic. And that's really, we've seen a lot of support uh, you know, swelling because of that. Um, it seems like this is just sort of a natural progression here um, as we prop up women's sports, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think just year by year, you're, you're constantly seeing women's sports grow and the viewership grow. And, um, you know, there's no excuse not to put women's sports on TV. There's people wanting to watch it. There's people, you know, going on these platforms, these smaller platforms to try to find the games. You know, it's it's something that has continually um grown, like you said, from the, the international stage all the way down to the NWSL, which is one of the top uh, programs or top leagues in the in the world. You're working on the sidelines. You're, you know, making sure that these athletes are in the best shape that they can be in and if they get hurt. And um, But I'm sure that you see little girls in the stands, uh, little girls when you go out and, and, and visit. Um, that's got to be it's got to fill your heart because you were one of those little girls at one time. Yeah, right? absolutely. I uh, I was one of those those young girls at one point, and and throughout my career, I've been I've been in the NWSL for this will be my my fifth year now. I started in in Portland and then Kansas City, and now I'm with the Wave. And I was that little girl, you know, working with some of my idols, you know, when I first got into into the league, and and I still am. I'm still starstruck by some of our players and. And to see these little girls yelling players' names and being awestruck, I'm just like, wow, it's it's something incredible to see from the other side that I never being that little girl would have guessed. So tell me what you tell me what you're doing. Tell me what you're, you're I guess let's start with a typical day and then I kind of want to know what you're doing on the sidelines. But what's a typical day like? Yeah, a typical day, uh, you know, we'll start we'll come in early. Um, we'll do, we'll have meetings, we'll go over player health, we'll go over subjective, objective measurements from the day before and that morning from players finding out how they're feeling, you know, what kind of load they sustained the day before the week leading up to that training session or game, you know, so if it's a training day, we'll come in, review some things, go over plans, meet with the technical and performance staff to make sure everybody's on the same page, who can sustain what kind of load. Um, and then from there, we start working with players. So if training starts at 1030, we'll start working with players at 830 
making sure that we mitigate any risk that they may have going into a training session, um, make sure that they can get the most out of every training session. So we'll do soft tissue, we'll do some movement exercises, um, we'll do activation, some prehab. And then from there, they'll go into a quick meeting where medical and performance during, while the players are with technical staff, medical performance, will kind of debrief, make sure that everything we thought we'd see going into the day is actually what we saw in our tables and make sure there's no other alternate, um, no other changes that need to be made to the training plan. And then we'll go out to training, be out there for, you know, hour and a half, two hours, come back in, make sure everybody is still alive and well, do any follow-up treatment care. Um, then from there, we'll have have a few more meetings to, to debrief everything that happened, send out the treatment schedule that night for the next day, rinse, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's the same day over and over again, but it's over and over never again. the same day ever. <laughs> it's a great way of putting it. Yeah, it's a great it's, way of putting it. Yeah, it's definitely interesting every day. What are some of the 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 uh, typical types of um, the way the body has to react playing a game like soccer? Um, what kind of injuries? What kind of things do you have to look out for that are particular to this sport? Um, certainly that's somebody who's listening to this who, who may be just a, a kid playing in some kind of a rec league or even an adult playing in a rec league. What kind of things does this sport do to your body that you maybe wouldn't see in other sports? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. I think that, you know, there's the there's you know, there's a concussion here and there, right? When you uh -huh. when you have that head contact, whether it be with the ground or with the ball or with another player. Um, but then there's also a lot of soft tissue injuries. You're looking at you know, a lot of quad, hamstring, adductors, those big muscle groups in the upper or in the thigh, the upper leg area is something that can chronically plague some athletes if not managed appropriately. Um, we've been pretty fortunate, knock on wood. We've done a lot of movement assessments and specialized training for, for individuals that maybe had an asymmetry um, from their hamstring to their quad or from left to right um, based on previous injury to make sure that you know, those aren't things that um, if they do occur, they're minimal um, because those are things that can hold you out for a really long time. You know, you hear about very athletic uh, athletes with pace that have hamstring injuries because it is such a mm. powerful muscle group and making sure that we can mitigate that through everything we do is something we we take a lot of pride in here. And we've got a great medical staff. We have another athletic trainer on staff. We have a, a PT that that's working with us through um, another one of our, our partners. And it's just, um, it's a full holistic approach here in, in trying to mitigate that. And then even looking further at, you know, the soccer specific, but the, the women in, in soccer and the specific injuries to women versus men, you know, you have a Q angle, which is just kind of the way the hips sit for childbearing mm -hmm. in women, um, that opens you up to things like an ACL or patellofemoral mm -hmm. pain. So that front of the knee that gets a little achy um, with high loads, those are things that are, are massively impacted on the women's side versus the men's. You also have things like bone stress issues um, based on nutrition and, you know, women are more susceptible to have um, nutritional issues and iron deficiencies um, based on our makeup. And so making sure that we're monitoring those closely and we have a sports dietitian that works with the team mm -hmm. to ensure that we're all on track, you know, preseason labs, midseason, postseason, um, we get those done through Kaiser and, and it's something that we monitor closely to ensure that we're supplementing and once again, trying to mitigate those big injuries. Tell me about when, uh, when we're watching and we watch someone get hurt on the field, mm -hmm. on the pitch. I'm trying to use the right term. Pitch, You're right. right. I'll, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm not going to critique you by any means. <laughs> so, um, someone gets hurt. Someone goes down. You're. I, I assume you're on the sidelines at every game. Yep. And you run out. Tell me what. First of all, just do you have that? Uh, we all have the sense of, oh my gosh, what happened. Is there a little bit of that with you or is it just, hey, this is time, this is this is what I'm paid for, this is what I'm doing? Yeah, no, it's it's a little bit of, oh gosh dang, what do we have here? It's a little yeah. I sit on the sideline ball of nerves the whole time. I'll uh 
it's funny, we'll talk with technical staff after the game and they're talking about what they saw. And I'm like, I didn't see any of that in the game. I'm just watching how everything's <laughs> moving and, and making sure, you know, if somebody got knocked here, I'm watching them for the next couple minutes to make sure that they're moving appropriately. So there definitely is those, those nerves. Um, but I'm constantly assessing as I'm running out to the athlete what I may see, what they're holding, what the tackle, or maybe if it's non-contact, what it looked like. Um, and then as I get out there, it's um, a quick assessment in terms of, all right, are they hysterical or are they, you know, within a within a right headspace that I can start talking to them? If they're not, if they are a little bit hysterical, it's it's all about calming them down because you're not going to get mm -hmm. anything out of an evaluation when they're frantic. Um, and so it's just getting out there and um, and talking to them. I think one of the best things for me that I've learned in my career is having rapport with athletes will always benefit you. And so the first thing I do is let them know that I'm there and that they can take a breath and that we'll figure out what's happening, right? And then from there, it's figuring out, all right, is this something where I need to go higher up? I need docs, I need EMS, I need, you know, something like that. Or is it something that I can get them calm down, evaluate, and then go from there? So it's a lot about trust. Oh, you know, absolutely. That you, you have this, it's very important. Mm -hmm. Um I assume, and I see this just again as the viewer from the side. Um, athletes, there are some athletes that 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 probably will you'll know they're in pain, and there are probably a lot of athletes that you deal with that that want to. You know, I'm tough. I'm going to tough it out. I'm not going to. I'm not going. I'm not going to cry about this one. Yeah, I, sh I assume that makes your job a little more difficult, right? Because you got to figure out wh where's the real damage here, right? Absolutely. Our my job and our job as athletic trainers is to protect the players from themselves. If you ask any of these pro athletes if they want to keep going, they will say yes. And that's why they're pro athletes. That's how they've gotten to this far is because there is that that ability to mentally push through pain and mentally push past these things. And it's my job to coax that out sometimes and figure out, N no, you, you can't do that. So, you know, there's the subjective piece of injuries, asking them, hey, are you okay? Can you keep going? But then there's also the objective piece where it's like, jump, <laughs> jump two feet for me, you know, jump one, one foot, cut in and out. If you can, you know, those soccer specific movements, if you can coax them out of that, there's no cheating those, you know, there's yeah. no, oh, I can tough this out. I'm okay. You can visually. So it's, it's figuring that out, but definitely it's a, it's a game of protecting them from themselves a lot of times. That's interesting. Uh, we, we, of course, know that there is, um, and, and I'm sort of shifting now to more of a mental health space in this game, yeah. um, that there is certainly a mind-body connection when we're talking about physical activity, physical health. Mm -hmm. um, tell me the way in which you see it manifest itself in this sport in particular. Absolutely. I mean, the mental health aspect, I think it's often overlooked and it's often disregarded. And I think over the last few years, just the same way that, you know, women's sports have been, you know, getting the, the attention that it's deserved. I think mental health within sports, within the world, within, you know, the gen pop, within men's sports, within all of it has been truly getting the attention that it needs and deserves. And that stigma has, has resolved for the most part. Right. There's still always progress to be made. But I think that, you know, a lot of times with these athletes, it's when you're going through something like a long term injury, like an ACL or, you know, a, a high grade hamstring, something like that. There's the physical aspect of the injury, but there's also the, the mental aspect. You're you're asking a player who has worked out every day of their life and works out for a living to no longer be able to do physical activity. If you disregard that mental piece of that, you're losing, I would say, over 50% of your recovery. And so I think that the mental health aspect, whether it be long-term injury, whether it be a simple on-field evaluation, it's something that is all-encompassing in this sport and in this profession. I assume that's also that's part of that trust, right? If you can understand mm -hmm. and respect the mental part of this game and the mental part of what an athlete is going through, yep. they're going to trust you that you can care for them, right? Absolutely. And as you're as you're going through something like a long term injury with a player, 
there's going to be ebbs and flows. There's going to be highs and lows. And, and it's super important to have that rapport with your athlete to be able to say, hey, I know today is not a good day for you. I know you're struggling. We're going to get through the exercises you need to do. And then you're going to go home. You're going to get out of here. You're going to go do something that brings you joy. You're going to get away from this environment because right now that's not what's best for you. You know, I assume you add add a wellness component to all, everything you guys do, right? Absolutely. So there's um, uh, I've talked about the subjective measurements that we look at look at um, daily. We have a survey that players do every morning when they wake up, and it it goes from you know anywhere from the standard soreness levels, soreness sites, um, through to how many hours did you sleep last night? Uh, was it quality sleep or or are you still exhausted? Where's your mood at today? Where's your stress level at today? Because all of those pieces do play a factor on the the body's physical ability to perform what we're asking of it out there. And so if we have a player come in and, and their mood is trash, they didn't sleep last night, they're feeling super high in stress, that player is not going to complete a full training session with us because that that player is going to be at risk of hurting themselves physically because there is that relationship between mental ability and mental um, state and what you physically can achieve. And it's not worth push, pushing past. It's We see it from a performance and medical side as something being, uh, we see it from a performance and medical side as something crucial to assess daily and to make decisions based on. What kind of things for a, a young athlete um, and, and maybe not necessarily going to be professional, but a young athlete right now, what kind of tips would you say um, they should be doing, he or, she, he or she should be doing to keep themselves in good physical shape and good mental health uh, as they want to move on, maybe in, in a career in soccer or maybe in college or just for fun? Yeah. A couple of things they should be doing. Absolutely. I think one of the, the, one of the most important things is, is listening to your body. And so making sure you're getting a good warm up before you do anything. If you start feeling something, you know, left side versus right side or quad versus hamstring that just doesn't feel right, listen to your body. It's telling you something, right? Take off a couple, a couple, um, a couple actions at the end of the, the, the training session. Maybe you only hit 10 shots each side and not 20, right? Listen to your body as you go through in terms of, of physical. And then I think from a mental health aspect, I think something that, that, kids can do as they grow up is set goals. Um, our athletes are still setting goals. Um, set a big goal and then set a bunch of little goals. How are you going to get there? You know, you got this big, oh, I want to play professional sports. Well, that can't be it. You got to, you know, what do you, what are the steps to get you there? And then how are they achievable? You know, how do you measure your success? This can't be the measurement of success because not everybody gets here. There's mm -hmm. 10 teams in the league right now you have a roster of 20 there's 200 players in the, you know there's a lot more than 200 kids out there playing soccer right now and so this can't be the measurement of success where else are your goals falling and how are you measuring them you know it's it's not everything is not the end of the world although it always feels like it I, but i think having those achievable measurements of success really help and they still help our athletes. We have a we have a performance a mental performance and wellness coach um, on staff and and she's constantly making goals, reassessing goals, looking at the measurement of success that players have set for themselves and constantly evaluating, readjusting, making new ones once they're achieved, etc. Yeah. I love that. And and just uh, let's flip it around now to your journey. <laughs> if I wanted to, you know, become a trainer for a team whether it's college or professional, what kind of things would, what kind of advice would you have? Oh man, uh, my journey is interesting. I, uh, I, I grew up playing soccer. I played in college and, and I transferred to a division two school to continue playing where I got to um, continue playing and get my degree in athletic training. I went and did my final semester internship with FC Dallas. I found some emails online, just, emails of, of athletic trainers that were in the league at the time, cold emailed, let them know who I was, what I was doing, and and just kept inching my way up and, and just trying to, to get my foot in the door. And I think 
the the biggest advice that I have for somebody looking to get into my profession is is to keep knocking on doors, to con- to continue to expand your network because it truly is all about who you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then from there, once you have a crack in the door, work your butt off. I cannot stress that enough. This job is gritty. It is hard. It is long hours. It is one of the hardest things I've done the last five years, but oh, so worth it. It is so worth it. And so those would be those would be the keys that I would say somebody trying to get into athletic training or or a professional sport setting in general. That's kind of, it kind of works with any kind of career too, right? Just work, yeah, work your I'm butt sure off. If right? I, I'm sure if I sat here and asked you, you would probably say the same thing, you know, all about who you know, work, yeah. networking <laughs> and working hard. Keeping exactly. Like that, be ready to put in, put in the hours for the reward. So the last question I have for you is, is uh, for someone who may not be quite yet familiar with the game of soccer, uh, you may be attached to American football or baseball or whatever. Tell me what you should love. What is there to love oh. about soccer and in particular women's soccer? Oh, man. You know, a lot of people have been telling me they've been watching Ted Lasso to try to get up to yeah. eat on, on soccer. <laughs> I, have, yeah. Yeah, I was going to I was gonna ask when you said you were getting into soccer. I said, Ted Lasso, that got you. Um, man, what should they love about the sport? They should love the passion. They should love the intensity. I, I struggle with professional sports like like baseball, like uh, like the MLB, like the NBA, because there are so many games and, uh-huh. and it's hard to follow. It's hard to see that passion game in and game out because, you know, it's diluted. Uh, mm-hmm. Our sport is far from diluted. Every point matters and every mm-hmm. match is a grind and a fight. And I think a lot of times there's a... Uh, there's this aspect of, of professional soccer and the faking of injuries and the, the roll around <laughs> the dramatic, you ain't getting it from this team and you're not getting it from this league. Um, trust me, I wouldn't let my players do it because then I'd just be sitting there even more nervous, but it, it's not on the women's side. These, these, these women, they come to play and they mean business and it is 90 plus minutes of fight. And so 10 out of 10 recommend get yourself to, Get yourself in front of a TV for our next game. Get yourself with some friends and 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 YouTube soccer for you know what is it soccer for dummies you know yeah. get, get a, a couple basics. But man, it's it's fun. It is fun. Get out to a game as well. Those are even more fun to get there in person. I love it. I love it. Bailey Torres, thank you so much. I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be watching you on the sideline, thinking about uh oh, what she's what she's thinking of. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for spending some time, and, and thanks. It's so glad that, that we have a partner in San Diego and that uh, we got a place to go watch women's soccer. Absolutely. We are so happy to be partnered with KP, and, and we could not be more ecstatic to be here in San Diego. So let's get you out to a game soon, and, uh, yeah, I'll see you around.